Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Insha'Allah, in this video, we'll discuss some of the remaining events before the Battle of Uhud took place. So between Badr and Uhud, a number of small expeditions took place. Each had its own reasons and issues and benefits. The first of these incidents is called the expedition of Qarqaratul Qudr, after the place where it happened. Some of the neighboring Mushrik tribes of Medina wanted to take revenge on the Muslims because their business had been cut off as an indirect result of the Battle of Badr. Because now the caravan of the Quraysh had to divert its route. Therefore, only seven days after the Battle of Badr, some of the tribes of the Banu Salim and Banu Ghatafan, two very large tribes of Arabia, Ghatafan was one of the largest tribes of, in Arabia, detached a small entourage of 200 people to attack Medina. When the Prophet peace be upon him heard this, he launched an offensive attack against them. And when the pagans saw the Muslims, they fled, even though quantity-wise, they were more than the Muslims. And what's more, they left all of their tents, belongings, and animals. So the Muslims basically acquired most of their animals, and this was a huge surplus for them, so much so it said every Muslim who participated got two camels. When the Sahaba reached their vicinity, the first person they found was an Abyssinian slave named Yasar, and they captured him. Others fled, so Yasar was left with the Muslims, and he converted to Islam after a while, after seeing how good the Muslims were. So the Sahabi who captured him said to the Prophet, peace be upon him, Ya Rasulullah, he is yours. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, never kept a male slave, so he was freed. But Yasar remained with him as a servant, so he became one of the servants of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And as usual, it was a sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that, we, that he would camp for three days after any battle. This was a sunnah that is established from Badr. So he camped over there. And in explaining why the pagans fled, he told the Sahaba, I have been helped by Allah that my enemies are terrified of me, even if I'm at a month journey away. This is one of the ways Allah helped the Prophet, peace be upon him that just by seeing and hearing of the Muslims, the enemies would flee and run away. The second expedition was a Sariyah of Sawiq, and this occurred around two or three months after Badr, probably in the early part of Dhul Hijjah. The reason for this battle is, Abu Sufyan had made a promise to Allah that he would not take a bath until he avenged Badr. He would not take a bath even from Janaba. This shows that taking a bath after Janaba was in their custom, which must have come from Ibrahim a.s. He remained in that state for months, and finally he really had to do something. So he gathered around 150 to 200 of the Quraysh and launched an offensive attack. The Banu Nadir, another Jewish tribe in Medina, gave him protection, food, supplies, and water. This was now blatant treachery because one of the clauses of the constitution was you will not help the Quraysh against us and also if we are externally attacked the two of us will act as one. But they hosted the small entourage of Abu Sufyan before they attacked Medina. And then Abu Sufyan launched an offensive into one of the date gardens of Medina and he killed two Ansaris, burnt down the garden, etc. This was blatant terrorism. When the Muslims found out, they attacked the army of Abu Sufyan. And in their rush to flee, once again, just like what happened in the Qarqadul Qadr, the Quraysh fled and left their belongings. So why is this expedition called Sawiq? It is dried porridge that could be eaten for long periods of time. You mix barley and milk and butter and honey, and then you dry it. So it is packets of food that the Arabs would eat on a long journey. And when Abu Sufyan and his entourage saw the Muslims coming, they fled on their camels, and in order to lighten the load, they cut off the bags of sawiq. And so the Muslims were able to capture a lot of this, even though they were not able to harm Abu Sufyan. 
So Abu Sufyan returned and now at least he could take a bath because he killed two Ansaris. Yet another incident took place which was the Sariya of Qarada. Sariya means the Prophet peace be upon him did not participate and a Ghazwa is what the Prophet peace be upon him participated in. Sariya is any expedition the Prophet peace be upon him commanded but did not participate in and there are hundreds of Sariya as we mentioned. The Sariya of Qarada took place a few months after the Battle of Uhud, most likely in Rabi al-Awwal of the third year. And this was an important stepping stone to the actual Battle of Uhud. What happened was that the Quraysh were preparing the annual caravan. They had a meeting. What can we do about the caravan? Which route should, should it take? Badr had shown them that they could not take the standard route. Safwan ibn Umayyah was placed in charge of that year's caravan. He gathered the Quraysh and said, Muhammad and his companions have blocked our passages. If we take the sea route close to the ocean, most of them have already given their allegiance to Muhammad and are upon his religion. So what do we do? This clearly shows Islam was spreading. The people on the coastal line have not been attacked, but, but according to Safwan, most of them are Muslims. The biographers of the Prophet peace be upon him recorded mainly battles in the Medinan phase. So you have to extract a wealth of information from this type of sentence that just comes in the middle. For example, from the statement of Safwan, we learn that Medinan phase wasn't just battles. Islam is spreading so much so, most of the coastal regions are now upon Islam. People are converting through da'wah, interacting with the Muslims, etc. And he goes on, If we remain here, we will not go on any journey. We will not interact with the Syrians, we will not get any money, and our money will dwindle down to nothing. And our life depends on rihlat al-shita wa saif. One of the leaders, Al-Aswad ibn Al-Muttarib said, Let us go through the Iraq passage, so northeastwards, then double back down towards the route again to make their way up to Syria. This shows how desperate they were getting and how much of a success Badr was for the Muslims. So they had to find someone who knew the route and they loaded up the caravan. And as we said, this time the leader was Safwan ibn Umayyah. And effectively, this was Badr part 2. Allah had willed that all of his, this money would go directly into the hands of the Muslims. How so? The Prophet peace be upon him heard of this, even though it was supposed to be top secret, and he sent an expedition against them. How did he hear of it? It is mentioned that one of the elite of the Quraysh who knew was drinking wine with Salit ibn al-Numan, who was a secret Muslim in Mecca. And he boasted, the Quraysh have a plan that no one will be able to outsmart. We will take this and this route to Syria. And as soon as Salit heard this, he informed the Prophet peace be upon him. And this caravan was a hundred camels full of treasures. And it was just a caravan, not an army. So it was easy prey. The Prophet peace be upon him sent Zayd ibn Haritha to intercept the caravan and the entire caravan with all of the camels and 50,000 plus dirhams plus the leather and all of the other goods came into the hands of the Prophet peace be upon him and the Muslims. Allah had promised the Muslims back at Badr, I'll give you one of the two. But in fact, Allah gave them both. Subhanallah. In Badr, they got what they didn't want. And through Sariya of Qarada, Allah gave them what they wanted. The unarmed one. And there were no casualties. And this made the Quraysh so desperate that it led up to the Battle of Uhud. Let's now get into one of the most controversial issues. And that is the assassination of Gab ibn al-Ashraf. It is one of the most sensitive issues of the seerah and deserves some special attention. So who is Gab? And what's so sensitive about this issue? Gab ibn al-Ashraf was the son of an Arab father and a Jewish mother. His father was a pure Arab, a pagan from the tribe of Banu Naban, and his mother was of the Jews of the Banu Nadir. His father had committed murder so he had to flee from his own people, and so he fled and was adopted by the Banu Nadir of Yathrib, and they allowed him to marry one of their women. And from this marriage, Gab was born. So he was basically a full Arab and a full Jew. In Judaism, the religion is from the mother. So he had the nasab, 
lineage of the Arabs and also the religion, education and nobility that the Banu Nadir had. And he was one of the leaders of the Banu Nadir. He was known for many things. Firstly, he was a very rich man. He had his own fortress. Secondly, he was one of the most handsome people in Yathrib. And he was known for his poetry. And his animosity to Islam was demonstrated from very early on. When the Qibla was changed, it was Kaab who said, Why did they change the Qibla? And Allah quotes Kaab in the Quran. When the commandment for zakah was revealed, Kaab went to his friends who had converted from the Ansar and said, Do not give any of your money because I am worried you will become poor. And don't be hasty in getting rid of your wealth, for you don't know what will happen to this man, the Prophet peace be upon him. At this, Allah revealed, those people who are stingy, and they command others to be stingy, and they hide what Allah has given of his blessings. And many other things are mentioned. At the battle of Badr, when the two criers came back, when Kaab heard the news, he mockingly said, if Muhammad has really killed all of these people, and they are from the noblest of Arabs, then it is better for us to be inside the earth than outside of it. It is better to be dead than alive. And indeed, that is what happened in a while. When the victory of Badr was manifested in front of Kaab, he undertook a secret expedition to Abu Sufyan. He and some of the Banu Nadir went to Mecca and formed an alliance with Abu Sufyan against the Prophet peace be upon him. What are the details of this alliance? We have no idea. None of the books of Sirah are mentioned, but what could it be other than a surprise attack? One of the last things Abu Sufyan asked him, I ask you by Allah, which of the two religions is closer and more beloved to Allah? Our religion or the religion of Muhammad? Remember the pagans felt an inferiority complex toward the Jews since they were a people of civilization. Kaab said, you are more rightly guided than them. Allah references this in the Quran in Surah An-Nisa. See how they fabricate lies against Allah. This alone is a blatant sin. Have you, O Prophet, not seen those who were given a portion of the scriptures yet believe in Jib and Taghut and reassure the disbelievers that they are better guided than the believers? Allah is quoting Kaab here. This is exactly what he said in the private conversation with Abu Sufyan. He then returned to Medina after having formed the secret alliance, but Allah had told the Prophet peace be upon him of it. He had also written a lot of poetry against the Prophet peace be upon him and the Muslims. The last straw, however, was when he started writing a poetry about Muslim ladies out of mockery, as a satire, and it mentioned them by name. This was obviously crossing the line. According to Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, and Al-Waqidi, Kaab was assassinated between Badr and Uhud. But other scholars such as Muqatil ibn Sulayman, Al-Baghawi, and Al-Sahih, Al-Salihi, who wrote a 12-volume book on Sirah, one of the largest ever written, said he was killed after Uhud. And all of them add one more reason which Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, and Al-Waqidi did not add, and that is the blatant assassination attempt against the Prophet peace be upon him, which the Banu Nadir did. We all are familiar with the story of the Prophet peace be upon him, having been invited by the Banu Nadir for a poisoned meal. And this occurred after Uhud. And according to Al-Salihi and others, the guy behind the plot was Kaab. It was his idea to poison the food. And according to these authorities, Kaab was killed literally the night before the incident of Banu Nadir. So if we follow this version of events, it's even more clear why Kaab needed to be killed. But we still stick with Ibn Ishaq's version. In any case, the Prophet peace be upon him stood up and said, Who will take care of Kaab ibn al-Ashraf? For he has irritated Allah and his messenger. Muhammad ibn Maslama stood up and said, I will do it, O messenger of Allah. This Sahabi was from the Aus. Note that before Islam, the Aus and the Banu Nadir were one. Of course, this is of his wisdom that he did not want a Khazraji to do it, or else this would bring bad blood, as the Khazraj and the Banu Nadir already had problems from pre-Islam whereas the Aus and the Banu Nadir did not. So Muhammad ibn Maslama, being one of the senior of the Aus, volunteered in order to save the potential of the Jahidi civil war being resurrected. 
According to Ibn Hisham, for three days after this, Muhammad ibn Maslama stopped eating and drinking until finally somebody came to the Prophet peace be upon him to tell him about this. The Prophet peace be upon him visited him and asked, What is the matter? He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I promised you something, but then I realized I might not be able to fulfill it. He got so worried that in his anxiety, he stopped eating and drinking. Remember Gab was a rich man, well guarded, had his own fortress, etc. The Prophet peace be upon him said, All you need to do is try. Muhammad ibn Maslama said, In that case, O Messenger of Allah, allow me to say some things. You have to allow me to say things that I don't mean. And the Prophet peace be upon him said, Say as you like. Muhammad then called Kaab. There were other people sitting there, but he said to Kaab, Look, I have something very private I need to talk to you with. So they went to a corner. And Muhammad said to Kaab, This man, the Prophet peace be upon him, has come and caused us irritation for the last few years. And the Arabs are now all against us. On top of that, he is asking for our money, and he has put us through so much trouble and hardship. When Kaab heard this, he felt so happy and said, Wallahi, this is just the beginning. He will put you through much more hardship. And they continued talking in this manner, and you can see why Muhammad ibn Maslama had to ask for special dispensation from the Prophet peace be upon him. Until finally he said, Well, now we are his followers, and we cannot forsake him until the situation turns a little. Until that time, I need you to loan me to pay him that money. The Zakah. One of the ways Kaab ibn Ashraf got rich was by lending people money, and everybody knew it. And in his eyes, that is why Muhammad ibn Maslama was here asking for a loan. And of course, a loanee has to offer a mortgage. But Muhammad ibn Maslama said, I don't have anything to give, and that's why I'm here. So Kaab said, Okay, leave your wife in my house. But Muhammad ibn Maslama said, By Allah, you are the most handsome of men, and you expect me to trust a woman in your presence. Kaab took the bait, he was flattered, and said, Okay, then leave your sons with me. He then said, My sons, so they will grow up for the rest of their lives and their friends are teasing them. You were the mortgage that your father had to give. This is a permanent dishonor. I cannot give you my sons. Kaab said, What then? Muhammad ibn Maslama said, What if I bring you my weapons? And you know we need these weapons now because of all of these wars that are going on. So I am desperate to get them back. So this is a very urgent mortgage that you will possess. Kaab said, Great idea. Bring your weapons. And of course, we can understand the wisdom of this tactic here. Muhammad ibn Maslama can show up armed to the hilt and there will be no suspicion against him. There's a gray area as to what exactly happened, but it seems two or three of the other Sahaba, Sirkan ibn Salama or Abu Naida, had also gotten loans from Kaab along these similar lines. Then Abu Naida set a particular time. Look, we have to do this in secret. We don't want anybody to see us. So let's come at such and such a time at night and we will give all of this to you. According to Al-Waqidi, this took place on the 14th of Rabi al-Awwal in the third year of the Hijrah. The books of Sirah mentioned that there were no clouds in the sky and it was a full moon. The Prophet peace be upon him would walk with them to Baqi al-Gharqad and at the very end he said, May Allah help you in your mission. So they went to Kaab's castle which was on the outskirts of Medina and called upon Kaab to come outside. It said he had just married another wife and he was lying in his bed when he heard the call. He stood up to go but his wife held on to him and said, Where are you going at this time? He said Abu Naila and Muhammad ibn Maslama, they have come to give me some of their goods. She said, why are they coming at this time? This is not right. You are a man at war and I am worried for you. But he said, no, he is my foster brother and Muhammad ibn Maslama, I know him for a long time. I trust them both. So he went down. Muhammad ibn Maslama had already told his companions what he was going to do and that is that he would 
through some ruse or tactic, hold on to Ka'ab's head and have him in an arm grip, and then the others would do the deed. Now they knew Ka'ab was going to be armed because he was always heavily armed. He had one of the most expensive armors. That's what he was known for, to build and buy armors. They met outside. It was a beautiful night. And they began talking and gossiping as was the way in the days of Jahidiyyah. And Abu Na'ila said to his foster brother Ka'ab, I smell the sweetest perfume coming from you. Ka'ab said, Yes, I have with me a young lady who is the most scented of all of the women of Arabia. He said, Allow me to smell it. Ka'ab came closer. And he said, Abu Na'ida said, Oh, it's coming from your hair. Let me smell it. So Ka'ab lowered his head, and at this, Muhammad ibn Maslama held on to him, and the others did the deed. But it was not easy because of the armor he was wearing. And it said one of them, Al-Harith ibn Aus, was severely wounded by the others who were attacking. He was bleeding and had to limp back to Medina. When the Prophet peace be upon him met them, the Prophet peace be upon him put his saliva on the wound of Al-Harith and it healed instantly. So this was basically the end of Qab ibn al-Ashraf. And it is very obvious why this incident is problematic in light of modern times. And that is because the charge is given that this is a blatant assassination attempt that is justified by the Prophet peace be upon him. And it is an authentic incident. It is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, etc. Sahih al-Bukhari has a whole chapter on the killing of Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf. A number of reasons are given as to why the assassination took place. It was not because Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf rejected Islam or ridiculed the Prophet peace be upon him personally, but rather, the main reason is the treaty he made with Abu Sufyan. This was clear treachery, violating the constitution and was a clear threat to the Muslims. The poetry against the Muslims and specifically the Muslim ladies and the direct attempt to assassinate the Prophet peace be upon him, if we follow Al-Salihi's version. And of course these reasons are very solid. The problem comes not that he wasn't a criminal but in the manner which he was gotten rid of, assassination. In modern days, technically, there would be a trial. But frankly, this is one of our problems, that we are judging the political situation in the time of the Prophet peace be upon him as if it is in our time. We, were, we are judging him with our own laws and customs and trying to retroactively look at the seerah in light of modern laws. But again, frankly, those were different societies. And those were different times. And the people who lived in those societies, they understood the dynamics of that society. And that is why we go back to that interesting phrase of Gab's wife when she told him, you are a man at war. Even though he himself did not participate in a battle up until that point against the Muslims, but she understood that what her husband was doing was like declaring war. She understood this because the political landscape and customs and laws at the time were very different. Thus, there is no need for us to try to justify this incident in light of our laws. At that time, the Prophet peace be upon him is basically the government of Islam. His decree was political, religious, and legal, all in one. Therefore, he was the judge and he was the ruler. Thus, it is legal for him to do it in that manner. He did not do it in Mecca when he did not have any political authority. Rather, he did it when he himself now had actual political power. Thus, there is no need for us to defend this action. It is what it is, and we don't need to try to sugarcoat it. In that time and place, it was completely justified. The books of Sirah mention that not just the Banu Nadir, but the other tribes all complained about this. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not do anything about them because he had in fact ordered it himself. The message was given. Ibn Ishaq said that not a single tribe of them felt safe afterwards. And this was one of the reasons of the assassination, to send the message that you cannot get away with blatant treason. That will be it for this video. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.